Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel and welcome to a brand new crash course. In this crash course, we are going to cover authentication with JSON Web Tokens. In this crash course, we are going to be building a simple API where we can use JSON Web Tokens to authenticate our users and authorize certain routes. So if you ever get lost when creating this API, you could go to my GitHub page to just look at it as a reference, even though we will be building it from scratch. This GitHub page can be found at Harblade 7, which is my GitHub username, and then over here, JWT Crash Course. At the moment of recording, it is private, but it will be public once the video is published. So you can take a look at that whenever it is that you need. So before we kind of dive deep into the API, let's talk a little bit about what authentication even is. And then later on in the video, we'll talk about what JSON Web Tokens is doing to essentially allow us to authenticate. So let's look at a quick diagram that really describes what authentication is. So essentially, authentication is the process of validating whether the user are who they say they are. For instance, if you decide to sign up, uh, sign into Instagram, you provide something like an email and a password. Authentication is the process saying that, hey, this is the correct user. This right here is the correct user. So if you provide an email of like a late harp at hotmail.com and a password of a password, well, authentication of the pro is the process of saying, yes, this is the correct user. So this is authentication. Now, once you are authenticated, you probably are going to make a bunch of requests within the application. Now, some of these requests, even though you are authenticated, you might not be authorized to do. For instance, again, let's go back to our Instagram example. So let's say I am signed into Instagram. We went through the authentication process and I'm signed in and I go to a bunch of uh, Instagram pages. Let's say this Instagram page is a public page. Well, at this point, I am authorized to basically make this request and get the data. So I am authorized to this. But let's say this is a private account over here and I'm not following this account. Well, at this point, even though I am authenticated, I am not authorized to make this specific request and get this data back because, well, I'm not authorized because I shouldn't be seeing these pictures. I'm not following that individual over here. Maybe I am. Uh, maybe this is a, uh, a private account, but I am following that individual. In this case, I am authorized to actually request the data for this particular account. And over here, this is kind of a similar situation. Maybe over here again, private account and not following. I'm not authorized to see this data. I'm not authorized to make this request over here. You can probably imagine this is maybe a public account and I'm able to see this. So that right there is authentication and that right there is authorization. In this crash course, we will be covering both and we're going to be using that with JSON Web Tokens. So let's actually go ahead and start coding out right away in the next section. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up our project. Now, before we actually go ahead and start coding, we need to install a few things if you don't have them already. The first thing that you absolutely need is to have Node installed. So if you don't have Node installed, just go to this URL right over here and just install this version where it says recommended for most users. This is, allow this is going to allow us to have Node and NPM, which is needed because we are building a Node Express API. So make sure you have Node installed. The installation process is very, very easy. Now, the next thing that we need to have installed is Postman. Postman over here is a way that we can actually test out our API. We're going to be making a bunch of post requests to our API, and there's really no way we can test it out in the browser. And that's why we are going to use Postman to test out certain routes. The absolute last thing that you need is some sort of text editor. I am using VS Code, which is by far the most popular text editor out there, but you can use a bunch of text editors, whatever it is that you prefer. So once you have all these installed and once you have your text editor open, create a directory where you want your project to be housed. So I have over here a, a JWT, that's where I want it to basically my project to be housed. And then I opened this VS Code text editor at this particular project. 
Now in here, we're going to do a little bit of setup to set up our Node Express application. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to open up the terminal. So let me quickly just zoom in here. So we want to open up the terminal and we want to initialize a new node project. And to do that, we do npm init npm init dash y to create a package.json file. So we'll give that a quick second and we should have a package.json file in no time. Let's just wait a little bit longer. And this, there we go. We have our package.json. Now the next thing that we want to do is we want to create just an index.js file. This is basically where uh, our express application is going to be up and running. So we'll, we'll do that a little bit later in a second. Now the next step that we want to do is we want to install a dependency known as Nodemon. Nodemon is a dependency that allows us to auto reload our uh, node application. Because if we ever make a change in a node application, we actually have to restart the server to actually see it. Whereas Nodemon detects these changes and automatically reloads our server. So it's very important that we install this. So we can install this globally by doing npm install Nodemon and then with the dash G flag, which allows us to install it globally. Now I already have this installed and you can check if you have it installed by doing Nodemon version dash V. And over here, I get a version. If you get an error, that means you don't have this installed. Now over here in the package.json, let's create a start script. So we're gonna say start, and then this is going to be nodemon, and then index.js. So essentially we're saying that, hey, we want to run this index.js file, and if any changes occurs in this index.js file, then go ahead and auto reload our application. All right, so that is that. Now let's set up a simple express app. So let's go ahead and let's do a little bit of installation. So let's do npm install express and let's go ahead and do that. Now once that is installed, we should be able to see it in our package.json as a dependency. So let's do that. It should be relatively quick. And there we go. We do see it and we also see our node modules. Okay, so now we have our express app. Let's do a little bit of just manual express setup. So over here, we're gonna do const, or sorry, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna do const express and we're gonna require in basically that express library that we just installed. And then we're going to basically create an ex, uh, express instance. So over here we can just do express app and then we can do something like app.listen. And then over here, this takes in a callback and a port number in the beginning. So this port number is going to be 5,000. And over here, the callback is just going to be for logging purposes. We can basically say, um, now running on port 5,000. So let's go ahead and let's save this. So this is basically really all we need to create an express API. So let's go ahead and let us do an npm run start, which is going to run the nodemon index.js script right over here. So let's go over here and let's run that. And we should see a log very, very quickly saying, hey, you are now running on port 5000. So let's just wait up a little bit. And there we go. This is exactly what we get. Now, if we were to ever make a change, like add an explanation mark, we don't have to restart our server. Nodeman automatically restarts it. And over here we have the explanation mark. Now just to do another quick test, let's just do an api.get at the slash route. And then over here we have a rec and res. Uh, this is just basic express. If you are taking this crash course, hopefully you know a little bit of express uh, because this, this is mostly on authentication. But this is how an, uh, a route looks like in express. So let's just do a quick res.send so we can basically send something to the browser. Hi, I am working. Let's go ahead and let's save this. And now let us go to localhost. Uh, let's go to localhost 5000 at the slash route. And we should see here, hi, I am working. So there we go. We have our express application set up. Now in the next section, let's go ahead and let's start making some routes for authentication. 
starting with the log or, or sorry starting with the sign up route okay so let's go about creating the sign up route now the sign up route it has quite a bit of logic associated with it and this diagram kind of has a flowchart of all the logic that needs to be implemented inside of our sign up route so the first thing that we have to do is we have to get the email and password that the user provides us with. So with every single request, especially with the sign up request, they're going to provide us with the email and the password, and we have to somehow get that in our server. Now, once we get it, we need to validate it. We actually have to validate whether the email is actually an email and whether the password fits whatever criteria that we set. For instance, let's say our user provides an email that looks a little something like this. So let's go ahead and they provide us an email like this. Well, this is not a valid email and we don't want to store any user that provides us with an email like this inside of our database. So what we have to do is we have to validate, hey, is this actually an email? Is there, you know, a bunch of text and the at and then another text and the dot com or whatever? Is this an actual valid email? So that's one thing that we have to do. Also, we have to validate the password. So let's say they do provide us with a valid email, something like late at hotmail.com, but then they provide us with a password like, let's increase the text here. They provide us with a password of T. Well, this is a terrible password and we probably want to have some rules where we can essentially say, hey, the password has to be at least six characters or greater. So that way we can actually validate the password as well. So let's say we throw some sort of error and then the person says, you know what, I'll, I'll change this to um, uh, LeBron James. LeBron James. So this is going to be our new password. And this over here would pass this validation right over here. Now, the next step is to do a little bit of more validation. The next step is to check, hey, is this email already inside of our database? Did a person already use this email uh, uh, to sign up for an account? Because if there is a user with this email, we don't want to go ahead and create this user again. This can cause a lot of conflicts. So what we can do is we can essentially get this user and check, hey, is this user already in our database? And then if it is, then what we can say is we can say, hey, our user already exists with this email. Or if it isn't, then we can move on to the next step. So this is just another validation uh, step right over here. So the next step is to go ahead and do something known as hashing the password. And we're gonna talk about this in great detail when we get to it, so do not worry. But essentially hashing the password is just changing the password in some way. We never wanna store the exact same password inside of our database, because this is very, very unsafe. If a malicious user gets access to our database, well now they have access to a bunch of credentials. So we essentially want to protect this by changing this password in some way. And this is known as hashing a password. We're changing it in some way. So over here, we can change it to maybe something like this over here. And then once we change that, then we can go ahead and save that inside of our database. So we can go ahead and save it to our database. And then what we can do is we can send our users something known as a JSON web token. Now, I'm not going to explain this in great detail right now. I will once we get to it, so do not worry. But essentially, a JSON web token is a way that we can identify our users. So once the user signs up or logs in, we send them that JSON web token. And then for each, each uh, request afterwards, they're going to send us the JSON web token that we provided them with. And then essentially, we use that JSON web token to figure out the identity of the user and see if they have access to a particular request or not. So this is the flow that we are going to take and let's actually start with it in the next section. Okay, so let's go about creating user validation inside of our sign up route. Now to do that, first we have to go ahead and create this sign up route. Now we can go ahead and do this inside of the index.js. We can do something like app.post and then over here we can do something like sign up. But 
If we do it this way, we're going to have a bunch of different routes inside of our index.js and things could just get a little bit messy. So why not instead just group all of the uh, all of the routes that are associated with authentication into its own file and then I can just basically export that file into this index.js so that the, this index.js can use those routes. And we can actually do that in an express application, which is terrific. So to do this, let's go ahead and let's just create a folder where we're housing all of our routes. Now inside of this routes folder, let's create an auth.js file. In here, we're going to have all of our routes that are associated with authentication. Now, the next step is after we create these routes, we want to basically import them into the index.js so that index.js can use them. Now to do this, we can use the router method that express houses. So we can go ahead and do something like const router and we can require in express so we can require an express and then use the dot router method. Now, essentially now what we can do is we can do a modules dot export and we can export this particular router. So let's go ahead and let's save this. And now that we have exported this router, we can go into our app.js and we can basically import that in. So we can do something like, you know, const auth is equal to require and we require that particular route so route slash auth now to use it in this particular application we would just say app dot use and then we would specify a path that all of the uh, uh, authenticated routes all of the routes in this particular file file will follow and that's we're going to say that this is the slash auth path and then over here, we specify, well, what we want to use. We want to use this right over here, the auth that we just imported. So let's go ahead and let's save this. And let's over here, let's create a route. To do this, we would use router. Let's just do a quick slash get. This is just going to go to the root directory. Now over here, we're going to do a quick rec res and we're going to send res.send. We're going to send auth route working so this auth route is working now if we go to over here if we go to our browser and now what we want to do is we want to basically test if this is working now remember this is slash auth, just slash on its own but because over here we've specified slash auth this all the routes are going to start off with slash auth and then we can append whatever other routes that we want in or whatever path that we want want in so we have to do slash auth to basically see this route so over here we see auth route working now if i were to change this to something like um slash test or slash sign up then we would have to do slash test to see this particular route over here if i go back to slash auth it says hey we can't get that so right now, everything is working fine. Let's actually go about creating the actual sign up route. So over here, instead of slash test, let's do slash sign up. And instead of a get request, let's do a post request because this is a post request. So now let's go ahead and save this. And now if we go back to our browser, well, none of this is going to work. If you do slash auth even slash sign up, this isn't going to work. And the reason for this is because we can only do get requests inside of our browser. To test a post request, we actually have to go to Postman. And to do this, what we can do is we can create a new collection where we can basically test all of our routes. I'm gonna call this JWT. And then we're going to create a new request. Now this request is going to be is going to contain this URL over here, localhost 5000 slash auth slash sign up. Now over here is specifying what the request name is. So we can basically say sign up. So we can save this. And now we can basically click, click on it. We can actually append a sign up route and we can change this to a post request. So now we can send this and you can see that the auth route is working. All right. So what is the first step that we have to take? Well, the first step that we have to take is we have to get the user, the user's email and password. That is the absolute first step. Now, 
that is the responsibility of the client. If the client is making some sort of a request to a particular uh, endpoint, the signup route in particular, it is going to have to append some data within it containing the password and the username that the user provided. Now, this typically is going to be stored in the rec.body. So right over here, the rec.body, the request body. So over here, what we can do is basically access the password and the email from the rec.body. And let's actually go ahead and let's console.log this password and let's console.log this email. So we're gonna console.log this password and this email. Let's go over here to our actual node app. And so if I were to make a request to this, you can see we get a little bit of an error. So ta -ta -ta -ta, I wonder why that is. So it's saying, okay, well you cannot, okay, so you cannot get password from rec.body because it is undefined. Now the reason why the rec.body is undefined is because inside of our index.js, we have to basically allow for express to use JSON inside of the rec.body. And this is very, very easy to do. All we really have to say is app.use, and then we just say express.json. And this is basically a method right over here. So if we save this, and now if we go back and we send off this request, everything seems to be working fine. However, at this point, it is undefined, undefined. And the reason for this is because the client didn't specify any of the username or passwords in the rec, in the basically request body. So over here to do this in Postman, what we can do is we can go over here to the body, we can go to raw, and we're going to specify some JSON data. Now this JSON data is going to be, well, an email. And so this email is going to be harblaith uh, at hotmail.com. And then we are going to do a password of password. So let's go ahead and let's send off this request. Everything seems to be working fine. But over here, you can see that we actually get back our email and our password. So over here, if we go over here, we have completed this step right over here. We are able to get the email and the password from the user. Now, the next step is to validate that email and password. For instance, you know, I could have, I could have very, very easily provided you with something like this, just harp and very, very easily provided you with something with it like this, or just like P, or it even provided you, provide you with absolutely nothing. And if I send this off, well, I get this data back. I get Harb and then, well, nothing. And we have to basically validate if this is a valid password or email. Now we can do this from scratch inside of our signup route. We can do something like, you know, if the password.length, so if the password.length is uh, uh, less than six, then we can return some sort of error. Now, um, now essentially, this is kind of where it gets tedious, especially for the email. We we're gonna have to do some pretty complex validations for email to figure out, hey, is there an at right over here? Is there a dot right over here? Uh, this kind of gets complicated and very cumbersome and we're in a sense reinventing the wheel. There's many packages and libraries out there that do this exact same thing. And one very common uh, library that is out there that does this is something known as Express Validator. So this Express Validator is a library that allows us to validate certain things in our application. So we're gonna use Express Validator to do this. Now to, to basically uh, use Express Validator, we first have to install it as an NPM dependency. So we can do NPM install Express Validator. Let's do a quick installation. And right now you should have Express Validator inside of your package.json along with Express. So let's go ahead and let's go to our auth directory. And what we're going to do is we are going to import something from Express Validator. So we're gonna require in something from Express Validator. And this is going to be a check. So basically the thing that we're going to get is something known as a check. 
And this is basically going to be a method that allows us to check if certain things follow uh, certain rules that we've specified. Now to use express validator, we use it as a middleware that we append in between the route and the final call that we are trying to make. Now over here in this middleware, we specify an array. Now this is exactly how Express Validator is going to be used. If you want to learn a little bit more about Express Validator, you can just basically go to Express Validator. And this is a NPM package, just write NPM uh, right over here. So this is a very, very popular NPM package. Actually, this might not be it actually. Let's see here, NPM. Uh, let's actually just go ahead and let's just copy. I'm sure that's not the NPM package. Let's go over here. Let's just copy Express Validator. And let's go over here. So if you want to learn more about Express Validator, let's just press this. This is exactly how we would use Express Validator. So you can either get body or check. I'm using check for instance. And then right here in between the route and the final call, we're going to have a, a, an array that basically contains all of the checks that we want to make. So let's go ahead and let's do that. So over here, what we're going to do first is we're going to check if the email, so we're going to check if the email is an email. And essentially we can do these checks by appending a bunch of methods after the particular check. So we're going to check if the email is an email. So that is the first check that we're going to do. And this has a bunch of validations to really check if the email that we provided is an email. Now let's also do another one. Now to do another check, we basically specify a comma right over here saying that, hey, we're done with this. And then we can basically say that uh, we want to check this time the password and we want to check, hey, is the password, is its length, so over here is length, and then is its length, does it have a min value of six? So that right there is how we can basically append this. Now over here we can add multiple validations by basically appending multiple methods. We can basically do, you know, is lowercase for some reason or is uh, whatever, you know, there's multiple different things that you can probably read right over here, you know, is a date, is a whatever. So this is how we essentially use Express Validator, but I'm gonna have basically just these two requests or two validations right over here. So that is the first step. Now the second step is we want to basically tell it, okay, where we can get, where Express Validator can get access to this email and password because it can only get access to it from the rec.body. Well, to do this, we use another method known as validation results right over here. And basically right below, right here, what we can do is basically we can say something like const errors is equal to validation results and then we pass in the rec. And what this is basically going to do is it's going to look inside of the rec.body and it's going to look for basically the email and the password. And it's going to see if it follows these particular, uh, particular uh, uh, specifications or requirements that we have specified. Now, if they don't, what, what it is going to do is it's going to return an array of errors. So it's going to return an array of errors. And we're basically storing it right here inside of this error variable. Now, essentially what we can do now is we can do something like this. If the errors, so if the errors, and we can basically check if this is an empty array or this actually contains a little bit of errors. And we can do this with is empty, with the is empty method. So we can basically say, you know, if the errors is empty, well, this is good. Then we actually want to continue that the validation is, is great. Like they provided us with a real email and a real password. However, essentially if, if maybe this is not empty and we can basically specify the, uh, if it, uh, basically the, the not condition by having this explanation mark right over here, we can say, if this is not empty, then what we want to do is we want to return essentially a res.status, we want to basically throw an error. So res.status of 400, and then we can basically say dot JSON, because then we want to send back some data. 
And then the errors can basically be, well, errors dot array. So errors dot array. So remember, this is an array. Essentially over here, what we can do is we can basically get this array by using the errors dot array method. So that is basically this. Now, right here, we have set up a little bit of validation. We've actually pretty much set up our password and email validation. So right now, theoretically, if we pass in a password and email or password or email that doesn't meet the criteria that we've met, we should throw this error over here. However, if we do pass a valid password and email, we should basically get this, you know, uh, res.send auth route working. Let's actually say, you know, validation passed, because this is really what is happening. Validation passed or passed. So let's go ahead and save this and let's give this a quick test. So right over here, this is completely not valid. So we can go ahead and we can send this and you can see the errors that we get. So let's go over here. We can see here that we have essentially uh, an error here. You can say this is an invalid value, uh, email, whatever. Now, however, the only issue that we're facing is, is this is kind of not as descriptive as we want right here invalid value is not descriptive at all. You know, this is not a message that we particularly want to send back to our users. Instead, what we can do over here after uh, as the second parameter to the check, we can basically specify a, me a, 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 a message. So over here, we can say, please uh, provide a valid email. So please provide a valid email. And then over here, please provide a password that is greater than five characters. So greater than five characters. So now if we go ahead and we send off this exact same request, you can see that this is the message that we get, which is a lot more descriptive. So over here, please provide a valid email, please provide a password that is greater than five characters and I misspelled please. So let's go ahead and let's do that. So there we go, now we have our validations. Now let's say I do provide a valid email, but an invalid password. So we can go ahead. And now we only get one error. But however, we still didn't go to this step right over here because we still got an error. Now if I provided maybe a password of this size, still have that error. If we provide a password of this size, well, now we get the validation passed. Now I, I also misspelled passed because this should be passed like this. All right, there we go. So this works perfectly fine. But now the next step of validation is making sure that this email hasn't already been used inside of our application. An account with this particular email hasn't already been used. And we actually, to do this, we actually have to check our database. Now in this crash course, I don't want to go ahead and set up a database because this is a crash course on authentication. And if I set up a database like a SQL database or a MongoDB database, uh, it kind of becomes really a crash course about how we can start setting up these databases and storing this data. So I don't want to go about doing that. Instead, I want to simulate what a database is ultimately trying to do. And I'm going to do that by just creating a db.js file. And over here, I'm just going to do simply const users. And over here, I'm going to have an array of objects. So this is basically going to be our database. And our users are going to contain information like, well, email. So let's do late at hotmail.com, lathehard.hotmail.com. And let's say my password is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is how we're gonna basically store our data. And this is not unlike how actual databases store our data. So you're not really missing out by not using a database. So let's actually go ahead and let's just export this out. So we're gonna export users out. And now what we're gonna do is we are going to go ahead and just import this over here. And we can basically treat this like an ORM uh, of sort. So let's go ahead and let's just require it in. Sometimes they say import, I really mean require. I'm just used to uh, either working in a React application or working with TypeScript that allows for imports with Babel. Um, but when I say import require, it means the same thing. So let's go ahead and let's, uh, this is from our database. So we're gonna move into that directory. And so now what we can basically do 
is now we actually have to validate if that user already exists in our database. Right now, we only have one user inside of our database, uh, latharb at hotmail.com. So let's just write a quick note, you know, validated the uh, input. Now we need to validate if user it already exists. Validate if user doesn't already or validate if user yeah it doesn't already exist doesn't my, my typing is terrible today uh, if user doesn't already exist so to do this this is very very simple this is a very easy process we essentially what we do is we basically say hey let the user equal to the users you know from our database we can basically say dot use the dot find method and this is basically going to iterate through every single user inside of our database and what we're going to do is we're going to have some sort of a check here so over here we can basically pass in user and we can say you know if the user dot email is equal to the email provided return that particular user and store it as this variable right over here. So store it as this variable over here. Now, if there is no match, this variable is going to be undefined. If there is a match, it is going to be that particular user object. So essentially what we can say is, you know, we want this to be undefined. So we can basically say if user is undefined, so if the user does not exist, well, uh, actually, no, we, we want to check if the user exists. So if the user exists, now what we can basically do is we can throw an error. And we want this error to look exactly the same as the error that we get when we basically, uh, the, the error that we get when um, uh, we send back basically, uh, the error that we get from Express Validator. We want this format to be the same. We don't want to be inconsistent. So what we can do is we can basically copy and paste this and then now what we can do is we can do a res.status of 400. You can use more specific ones like unauthorized routes, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, but I'm just, so I'm just gonna use 400 throughout. If it's uh, not a server error, I'll use 500. Okay, so now we can basically do this and we can basically pass in an error that looks like this. And we don't really need the value. We don't need any of these really. We just need to provide a valid message, something like, this user already exists this user already exists so there we go now what we can do basically is let's actually go ahead and let's do let's, let's make this a valid user and this validation passed because harblate at hotmail.com doesn't already exist but if i were to use lathe harb at hotmail.com which is a user that does exist inside of our database and I were to make this request, I get this error message right over here saying that this user already exists. Now, if I were to again change the email, then we get the validation passed. So over here, we have completely accomplished these two steps, these two validation steps. The next step is after we validated our user, we want to go ahead and hash our password. So let's actually talk about that in the next section. All right, so now that we have completed these three steps, we are now moving on to this step right over here, hashing the password. So why in the world do we want to go about hashing the password? All right, so now that we have completed the user validation, we are now in this step over here where we hash the password. So let's talk a little bit about what hashing the password even means and why we even want to do it. So I have a few diagrams to kind of explain this. Now, let's say we get a bunch of uh, emails and passwords. There's different ways that we can actually store them in our database. One way is we can literally store them as plain text. So right over here, we have our database and over here we have the email and then we have the corresponding password. And over here, essentially, we're storing the password exactly how the user gave it to us. So over here we have password and then over here we have password one, password two, password four, password five, corresponding to each respective email. Now this is probably not a good idea. 
and you probably know why. If some sort of malicious user, some sort of hacker or malicious user within the company itself has access to this database, well, now they have access to a bunch of different credentials. And so now they can go into our software application and log in to whatever account that they want to, or basically what they can do is they can maybe get this password and start logging into other software applications because people use the same password more often than not. So this is not a great idea for security reasons. Again, we don't want to store this in plain text. So another way we can go about is encrypting our password. So over here, a user can provide us with a password. We can have some sort of key over here and using this key, we can encrypt this password into kind of this like jumble that doesn't really mean much to us. And then when we need to, to when we need to basically uh, get access to this particular password, what we can do is we can use this key again and we can in or decrypt it back to the original password. So over here, essentially we have this kind of encryption. We can use this key and then we can get this password back right over here. Now this again is a better approach, but it is not ideal. And the reason for this is if a malicious user if a malicious user gets access to our database and our encryption key, then, well, it is pretty much the same as storing our passwords in plain text. They basically have access to every single password in here because they can just decrypt it with this key right over here. Now, this does add another layer of security because now the user needs to get access to the database and the key but it is still not ideal. And there, again, the reason for this is because if the user gets access to both, well, the passwords are, well, compromised. They're, they're all there and this could lead to a lot of issues. So what's the other solution? Well, another solution is we can go ahead and hash our password. And that is the solution that we are going to take. And hashing is basically a one step thing right over here. It's a one way process. We have a password and then we hash it to some mumbo jumbo. There's an algorithm that does this. However, you can't, you can't basically decrypt this back into the original password. This is a one way process and there's a lot of hash functions that do this. Now, essentially how hash functions work is you give it a password and then it hashes it to, well, a particular uh, um, a particular set of strings corresponding to that password. Now, however, the only issue is, well, if I, pro if I provide it with uh, a password that is exactly the same, that hashed version of the password is going to be exactly the same as well. So over here is going to be completely identical. So this is kind of problematic as well. And the reason for this is because what hackers or malicious users can do is they can basically get a bunch of passwords that are very, very common, maybe like password or uh, I love you or, or very, very, very common passwords and get their corresponding hashes. And essentially they can just do a brute force approach where they can say, okay, does this hash correspond to this particular password? Does this hash co correspond to this password? Does this hash correspond to this password? And you know, with the technology that we have right now, this can be a very, very fast process. And if you have a weak, very common password, well, your password could be compromised. So essentially what we can do instead to kind of circumvent this is for each password, we can append an arbitrary random number amount of strings. So for instance, let's say a user provides us with a very, very weak password right over here. Let's say this password is, um, let's say this password, it's a weak common password. Let's just say, I love you. I heard, I heard this was a very common password. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I love you, my audience right over here. So this is a very common password, very, very weak. Uh, you know, this is probably at the top of the list of any sort of dictionary hash uh, or basically some sort of di 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 uh, hashed password and then the password itself dictionary. So this is a very, very common password. So what we can do to kind of circumvent this is append or uh, prepend a random group of strings. So it can be something like, you know, this. 
And so essentially, now we have basically this right over here. And this is, well, not a very common password. So then what we can do is we can go about hashing this. And then this is going to make it very, very difficult for any sort of brute force thing to occur, some sort of brute force attack to happen. Because now, well, I love you is a very, very common password, but I'm sure I love you seven hash uh, star four H W is not a common password. And this is why we want to append this string or prepend this string to this password. And these are known in the hashing world as salts. So that is exactly what we're doing. So let's go about and implement this mechanism right over here because this mechanism is the most secure. Now, if you, you want optimal security, you can actually implement a combination of mechanisms. You can go ahead and you can hash you can hash this over here so you can get basically the hashed version so you can add a salt you can go ahead and hash it and then maybe you can use a little bit of encryption so now the user what they have to do is you have to first get access to the database and then they have to get the encryption key and then after they get the encryption key they have to go through this whole brute force to figure out exactly what this password is supposed to be so that's a combination that you can do. We are not going to do that. We're just gonna mainly work on this over here, hashing our password. So let's go about doing that right now. So let's go to over here. So now we've done our validations. So now we want to hash our password. Now to do this, we want to use a library that allows us to hash our password because there's a bunch of hashing functions that we can use. There's very uh, common ones like bcrypt, uh, there's argon, and there's a very few ones, but the, but the most popular one in my mind is something known as bcrypt. So let's go bcrypt right over here. I always misspell bcrypt right here. So this is a very, very common library for hashing our password. You can see here, very, very popular. So let's go about using this one right now. So let's do npm install, and we want to install bcrypt. I always misspell bcrypt, so let me see. There we go, npm install bcrypt. So this is going to be our hashing function. So once that is installed, and this might take a little bit of time, we can basically get it. So we can basically say uh, bcrypt. So we can basically require that in. So we can say const bcrypt from bcrypt. And now <clears throat> what we can do is we want to go ahead and hash our password. So we can say something like, well, let our hashed password, not hard password, hashed password. So we're going to say, let our hashed password equal to bcrypt.hash. So bcrypt.hash. And the first parameter that we're going to provide is the password, the plain text password that we are trying to hash. And this is the password that the user provided. And then the second para parameter is a number symbolizing the amount of salt that we want to basically add to this hash. Remember, the more salt we add, the more salt, let's go back to our diagram, the more salt we add over here, the more uh, uh, the, the more safe our, the more secure our password is, you know, the, the less likely a hacker can actually breach this password over here and actually, you know, decode it into the correct password. Uh, because, you know, this is, this is, um, uh, you know, the more, the more things we add, the more things we append, the less likely the password is going to be breached. However, the more we append, the longer our algorithm is going to take to eventually decode once we provide it with the right password. So there's kind of a fine line that we want to do. We could add like a thousand, but then our password is going to take forever to be created and be uh, forever to be uh, kind of decrypted back to what it is supposed to be. Uh, so kind of a common convention is just to say the number 10. So this, this basically allows for a good amount of security without compromising how long it is going to take to hash the password and just bring it back to its original form. Now this over here is an asynchronous uh, uh, asynchronous call over here. And the reason for this is because this does take quite a bit of time. Hashing our password takes a little bit of time. So what we can do is we can basically call this over here, our function async. And then what we can do here is we can basically await it. So let's go about and console.log our hashed password at this point. 
So let's hash our password, console.log our hashed password. And let's go to Postman and let's just make a request. So it passed. And then if we go to our terminal, you can see our hashed password. And this is the password that we want to save inside of our database. So now what we can do essentially is basically save this into our database. So to do this, all we really have to do is do something like user dot or users dot push. And then we can basically push an object where the email is the email that is provided. We won't hash this or anything, even though that might not be a bad idea. So we have the email now because the key and the value are exactly the same. We can just provide email and uh, uh, JavaScript essentially interprets it as uh, email is the key and email is the value. And over here, we can say that the password is the hashed password. So now we are saving this to our database. So let's actually go about and let's make this request. So let's make this request. So we made this request once. Now let's try to make this request again it actually fails. It says, hey, this user is already created because we created this user and it has been appended inside of our database. Let's actually create a route where we can get all of our users. So let's go over here, let's do a app dot, or sorry, a router rather, a router dot get. We're gonna say all. So this is gonna be all users. Let's do rec res Actually, I always forget the order. Is it rec first or is it? Yes, it is rec res. And then all we're going to do is we're just going to do a res.json and we're going to send back all of the users. So over here, let's actually create a, a new route. Uh, da -da -da -da. Let's see here. Let's just right click on this and say that we want to add a request. We're going to say get all users. That's what we're going to call it. And essentially now what we can do is we can just copy this and we can basically paste that in here. We could save this if we want to as well. Um, you can save this. So we'll paste that in there and this is going to be slash off slash all. We can make this request. Right now we have nothing because we'll restart our server. So let's actually go ahead and let's make this request again. So now we are signed in. So if we make this request, you can see that this is how our data is going to look like. Now we have this email and we have this hashed password right over here, which is terrific. This is awesome. So now this is, I mean, if, if you know, this is going to be very, very hard for anybody to kind of breach this password. So now again, if I sign up again, because this user is already in our database, we have a bunch of, of uh, kind of uh, validations that prevent this from happening. So that's great. So if we actually go to our diagram, what we did was where is our diagram? There we go. So if we go to our diagram, we actually hashed our password and we talked about hashing and we also saved it to our database. Now the next step is to send a JSON web token and we're going to talk a little bit about what JSON web tokens are and how we can send them to our user. All right, so now that we have accomplished this step, we went about hashing our password and we saved it. The absolute next step is we want our server to send something back to our client that it can kind of use over and over again when making requests to indicate that, hey, I am authenticated. And this is where JSON web tokens come into place. So essentially what we can do is once the user passes in valid credentials, so once they either sign up or they log in with the correct password, so over here, they give us valid credentials and we go ahead and we process it in our server with our sign up route or our log in route and we're satisfied with everything, we want to give our client some sort of thing that it can use over and over again to kind of tell it, hey, I am this particular user. And this is going to be the JSON web token. So essentially, right after it passes the credentials, we are going to generate a JSON web token. So we're gonna generate this JSON web token. We'll talk about 
exactly what is inside of a JSON web token in a little bit. We're going to generate this JSON web token and then we're going to give that back to the client and then it is going to be the client's responsibility to store this JSON web token somewhere. Now this can be stored in a numerous amount of places. Let's actually go open up a, just open up our inspect right over here. And you can see if you go to applications, you can store it in local storage. You can store it in session storage. You can either store it as a cookie, but the client is responsible for storing this JSON web token. And again, this JSON web token contains information about who this client is. So now, once the client is authenticated and logged in, they have this JSON web token stored somewhere in their browser. And for each appending request, what they can do is they can send this JSON web token to the server. The server can then interpret this JSON web token, see that, okay, this is the user right over here. And then I can, they can determine if they can authorize a certain request or not. But this is basically the premise of a JSON web token. Now, if we go to over here, jwt.com, we can actually see how our JSON web tokens are going to look. And there's three parts to a JSON web token. There is the header right over here, which we are very, we're not gonna work with at all actually. And then we are going to work with these two sections right over here. So then we have the payload. And this right here is just kind of encrypted information about a particular user. So right here, this was decoded into, hey, the name John Doe, the uh, ITA of whatever this number is and whatever. So our JSON web token can contain information about our user. Now this is very, very easily decoded. They can literally just copy and paste this JSON web token into this uh, uh, kind of uh, text area right over here and see that information. So we never want to store sensitive information. For instance, we never want to store a password in here. That, that's a terrible idea. We might not even want to store an email. We will in our case, but it might not even be a good idea to do that. Uh, we want to store not, not so sensitive information in here. We will store the email, but the email might not be the greatest idea. So, and then the last thing over here is some sort of secret. And this is basically kind of the, uh, the security of the JSON web token. Inside of our server, we're going to have some sort of key. And this key, you can see it over here. Let's actually zoom in a little bit more. Let's see if that. This key can be kind of any sort of randomly generated uh, strings. So you can, over here, we have this particular key. And you can see how this secret right over here changes. So you can go over here, add some more, and you can see that the secret changes. Now, if somehow, some way, this is tampered with over here, let's say like this, we get rid of the Y, well, now we have an invalid signature because this secret right over here is basically in charge of this right over here. And this is kind of what allows for the security. So let's go back over here. And if we tamper, maybe get rid of the I, again, we get something invalid. And then we get, if we, if we continuously kind of manipulate and try to change our JSON web token, we are going to get a bunch of invalid data. And this is the only way that we can actually decrypt a JSON web token and see if it is truly uh, the JSON web token that our server sent out. Because only our server should know this key right over here, this guy. All right, so let's actually go about and let's code this application out. All right, so let us do this right now. So to do this, what we have to do is we have to install a package known as, well, JSON Web Tokens, because this is the package that is going to create our JSON Web Token. So what we can do is we can do simply npm install npm install and then json web token let's go ahead and install this and this shouldn't be too too long there we go and then over here we can do something like const jwt and this is going to be required from json web token all right so now over here at the very bottom what we can do is we can essentially create this token so let's go ahead and let's do something like well, const token. 
And over here, this should also be const because we're not really changing this. Uh, and over here, this should also be a return because we don't want to execute anything if we get any sort of error. I kind of forgot about that. My apologies. So over here, we can do const token, and this is going to be asynchronous. So we can do uh, JWT dot sign, and this is allowing us to create our token. So the first thing that we can pass in is the payload. Remember, the payload is kind of the text that we want our JSON web token to have. Essentially over here, we can basically say that our payload is going to be the email that was provided for our sake. Again, this might not be a good idea for security reasons because well, emails are pretty sensitive, but uh, we're just gonna do it for the sake of this application. So this is going to be the payload. And then over here, let's provide it with some sort of secret. That is the next step of the secret. We're going to have it be complete gibberish. Now, it's probably not a good idea to store it as plain text over here. You might want to have this in a .env file and not, you know, commit it to GitHub. But again, this is kind of a dummy app, so we're not going to worry about this level of security. So over here, this is the secret. And then the next thing that we can optionally add is an object where we can specify a bunch of different options. One option is, hey, you know what? I want this, uh, uh, when do I want this JSON web token to expire? You know, we probably don't want this JSON web token to be there forever. We might want it to expire at some point. So we can basically specify the time in seconds. I'm just gonna specify a really large time because I don't really care. I want it to really live as long as possible for this crash course. So over here, we have generated our token. And then the absolute next step is to send that token to our client. So now what we can do is we can say JSON, uh, res.json, and we want to send off that token. So now let's go to Postman. So now let's go to Postman and let's go sign up. Let's sign up with a kind of a more regular email. Let's just do late at harb or late at hotmail dot com we'll keep the password so now when we send it you can see we get back this json web token so if we go over here now let's go back to our uh, our website right over here and we paste this in you can see that we get well we get our payload so you can see here that okay we have our payload we have this but you can see that this is an invalid signature and this is essentially how we're going to validate our json web token if, if for some reason somebody decides to send us a, a JSON web token and it is invalid, and this is because this is the secret key that we're providing, um, we're going to basically not accept it. We're going to say that, hey, you are not authenticated. Now, in this case, this is the secret key right over here, and this is why it's not working. So let's go ahead and just copy that. And this is so this is a secret key that we are using so we can basically paste that in there and you can see that this is verified now if someone were to tamper with this or send off a like another json web token so let's say they got rid of the j you can see that all of a sudden now it becomes invalid so this is why we have the secret so now again this json web token is going to be stored somewhere in the browser and then for each upcoming request for each uh, uh, authenticated request where you need to be authenticated, it is going to pass this JSON web token into either the header of the request or the body. Now, commonly, it is going to be found right over here inside of the header. Uh, it's typically as something like X auth token and then our uh, JSON web token. So our JSON, so our JSON web token would be found somewhere right over here like this. So for each upcoming request, basically our uh, our server can then use this JSON web token to ensure who this user is and if they are really authenticated. But we're gonna do this in a future section. In the next section, we're gonna actually have to work on the log in route because we are actually completely done the sign up route. And now that we're done the sign up route and we have a good understanding of exactly what the process is, the log in route is gonna be very, very quick. So I'll see you guys then. All right, so now let's work on the log in route. And this is a lot simpler, especially now that we know about hashing in JWTs. So these are the steps that we are going to take to create our log in route. The user is going to log in with a username or password. 
And essentially what we are going to do is we are going to get that user's email and essentially search our database for the user with that particular email. Now, if that email is already inside of our database, we essentially get that user object that contains the email and the hashed password. If it is not found in our database, then essentially what we end up with is undefined. So at that point, we can trigger an error saying, hey, you need to go ahead and create an account. So once we do this, and once this is passed, let's say we do end up with that user object, we get that hashed password and we compare it to the password that the user provided. So over here, we have our hash password and we do that comparison and we can do this very easily with Bcrypt. Now, if everything is good, fine and dandy, then we send them a JSON web token like we did with our sign up route. So let's go about and do this in this section. So to do this, we have already created our sign up route. Let's go over here right below the sign up and under the all. Let's do a router dot post and this is going to be called log in and this similarly is going to be asynchronous rec res and then let's go about doing our steps so the first step is what well, we want to be able to get the password and the email from the rec dot body so they're going to provide that to us in the request body now the next step is to check if that email or that user with that particular email even exists and if they do we want to store it locally into our uh and out into our software so we can do something like let user is equal to users dot find we've done this exactly in the uh sign up route so we'll just do user dot find and we want to return user dot email is equal to the email provided and this will give us the user object so now the next step is to essentially say hey if the user is undefined if there actually is no user with that particular email then we want to go ahead and trigger an error now the error is going to look exactly the same as this so let's go ahead and copy this and let's paste it right in here except now we're checking hey if the user is not defined then we want to throw an error and we can say hey uh, we can say something like invalid credentials. Now we don't want to say something like um, something more specific like, hey, there is no uh, user with that uh, email. And the reason for that is because if we do this, then we are sort of providing uh, malicious users that are kind of doing a brute force attack. Hey, does this email exist in our database? Because if we provide a message saying, hey, this email doesn't exist in the database or or if we provide a message, oh, invalid password, they kind of have a, a, a way of knowing, okay, well, this email is valid, I just have to figure out the password. But if I provide a generic message like invalid credentials, then they don't know whether it's the email or the password that is incorrect. So that's why we're gonna have this kind of, um, kind of generic message right over here, okay? So there we go. So that is the validation step. And this is really the only validation that we need. We could also add the, the uh, express validator to, to uh, validate the email. But I mean, this is pretty good enough because, well, we're never going to have an email inside of our database that is not really an email. Uh, and this is because we already have in the sign up route this check over here. So maybe we could add it just to prevent unnecessary iterations in our database. But I'm not going to do that because, well, uh, I want to keep this as short as possible. It's already running too long. All right. So that is that. And now what we want to do is we want to essentially compare the hashed password of that email to the password that was provided. So remember, the hash password is inside of our database. So let's actually quickly go to Postman and let's make a sign up or let's actually, yeah, let's do a sign up request and then let's do a get all users. So over here, you can see here that this is how our data is going to look. This is just an anomaly that we created, but this is typically how our data get, is going to look. And this is how our user is going, our user password is going to look. So we have to essentially compare whether, hey, this password over here is equivalent to the password that is provided. So we can do that with bcrypt. So we can do that with bcrypt.compare. And the first thing that we can do is provide the password that the user provides and then the hashed password. 
And so the hash password is going to be from the uh, database and this is gonna be user.password. Now we can actually store this. Uh, this is going to return either true or false. So if the password is, is not valid, then it's gonna return false. If it is valid, then it is going to return true. So we can say something like is match is equal to this. Now this is going to be asynchronous because it is going to take some bit of time. So essentially we can go ahead and await this. So now what we can do is if this returns false, we can basically trigger this exact same error saying invalid credentials. So let's go over here and it seems like we're not copying this. Let's copy this again and let's paste it in here. We can say if this is false by doing is not is match we can say invalid credentials and then the very last thing is we can go ahead and generate that token and we can go ahead and send it back so let's just copy this over here and we're going to uh, generate it with the exact same secret right over here so let's go ahead and let's save this and at this point we are pretty much done our login route so let's go ahead and test it so let's go ahead and let's just go to our sign up route let's just copy this because it's going to be exactly the same uh, except for the appended login and let's add a request we're gonna say login so and this is going to be slash login and over here this is gonna be a post request and so what we're gonna do now is let's just get all of our users so over here we have uh, let's go over here and let's go all of our users at this point we only have this one user Let's create a user right now. So we're gonna create a user. Let's create Spider-Man at Batman.com. And then the password is Wonder Woman123. So this is the password. So we're going to sign up with this with these credentials. We get this JSON web token. And right now, inside of our database. We have this right over here and it's all hashed. So now what we can do over here is we can go ahead and log in. Now inside of the body, we'll provide it with the data that we need to provide it with and that's going to be well our credentials. So the email is going to be, uh, I believe it's spiderman at batman.com. And then the password is uh, Wonder Woman one two three i believe wonder woman one two three so if i go ahead and provide this you can see that everything is all fine and dandy and i get another json web token now let's say i i i, uh, I input the wrong password so let's say i get rid of i just say woman instead of wonder you can see here invalid credentials over here you can go back to wonder woman valid credentials let's say i provide an invalid email invalid credentials there we go so we have essentially set up our login route very very quickly so now that we have created our routes let's start talking about how we can actually um, kind of protect certain routes depending on whether you are authenticated or not so we want to prevent access to certain routes depending on your whether you're authenticated or not and we'll do that quickly in the next section Okay, so now that we are authenticated and we sent out our JSON web token to our client, we're going to want to now protect certain routes depending on whether the user is authenticated or not. So remember, over here, we're authenticated, we know the identity of the user, but now we want to protect certain routes depending on the identity of that particular user. Again, this is known as authorization. So this particular user, once authenticated, they may have access to this route, this route, and this route, but maybe not to these routes over here. Now, if they're not authenticated at all, maybe they don't have access to this route and this route as well. So over here, we want to start protecting routes depending on the uh, identity of that particular user. So let's go about doing that right now. Now over here, what we're gonna do is a very simple example. If you are authenticated, you have access to a particular route, and if you are not authenticated, then you don't have access to it. So essentially in our example, we're really gonna have two routes right over here. One that you always have access to, and one that you only have access to 
if you are authenticated. But the same premise can really go on with more complicated logic. You can really start figuring out the user identity and figuring out if they have access to this particular route or not using the very, very same logic. So let's actually go about doing this right now. So inside of our database, let's say we have a few more tables or collections or whatever database that you're trying to use. Let's just say here collections for the sake of uh, us because we're really dealing with uh, Mongo, uh, kind of like JSON format data, which is like NoSQL, but that doesn't matter. Don't worry about that. I'm not trying to confuse you. So let's go ahead inside of our database and let's say we are creating a post application and you can only see a certain number of posts if you're authenticated, but there's other posts that you can see if you're not authenticated. So let's say public posts, and we're gonna say here, um, this is going to be an array of objects, and each post is gonna have a title, and we're gonna say here something like free tips on development. So this is gonna be the title, and then the content, so the actual text of the post, we're gonna say these are some tips. And let's go ahead and let's just duplicate this. Uh, oops, I was always do this. Let's duplicate this three times over. So these are uh, kind of public posts that anyone can see. You do not have to be authenticated to see the ones. Now over here, let's say we have something like private posts. So these are private posts and maybe this is only for authenticated users that paid for the service. So it could be something like this. So let's go ahead and let's copy this. Let's post it over here. And we can say something instead of uh, free tips, we can say paid tips on development. And so these are the tips. Let's actually go ahead and copy this two times over. So over here, we only want to show this if we are authenticated. And over here, we want to show this well, regardless if you are authenticated or not. So let's actually create the routes for these. Now over here, we can we could append it in the auth.js, but that really makes no sense. Let's create a new file known as post.js, and it's gonna follow the rel relatively the same format. We're gonna have over here, we're gonna have, um, where is it? We're gonna have the router. So let's copy that and let's paste that in there. And then we're going to do a module.exports of that router. And then inside of our uh, package or inside of our index.js, we're gonna go ahead and copy this. We're gonna call this slash post posts. And this is gonna be called post. And of course we have to import this in. So we can just quickly copy this. We can say from slash post and we can call this post instead of auth. So let's create the uh, public route first. So let's do a router and then dot get. And we can just say something like slash public. And then we can do a rec res. And we can just simply, uh, let's get the data from our database. So we can do const uh, require in. So what do we wanna require in? We want to go to our database. And we want to get the public Okay, well, the reason why we don't see it is I didn't, I didn't export it over here. So let's go ahead and export it. So we want the public posts and the private po posts uh, exported. Over here, we can just say now public post. So essentially now all we can do is something like res.json and we can go ahead and just send off this public post. So now let's go to Postman. Let's create a brand new request. So we can say get public posts, save this. And then we can go over here and we can do something like slash posts slash uh, public. And now we can go ahead and send this and we get these posts right over here. Now, keep in mind, we do not have to be authenticated at all to make these requests because you can see here in our header, we don't have a JSON web token. We have nothing in our body. We can just be any random user that makes a request to this and we get this. And this is what we want. Now, that's not what we want for the private posts. So let's actually go about and let's copy this. And this is going to be for the private posts. So let's paste that in there. And so this is going to be slash private. And over here, we want to get the private posts and let's say private. So now let's go ahead and save this. 
let's create another uh, route. So let's save this one. And let's create another request rather. And so get all private posts. So let's save this. Let's go here. Let's paste that in there. And now this is going to be private. Now the way that we constructed it is exactly the same way that we constructed the public one. So anybody has access to this, but we really don't want anybody to have access to this over here. So how can we essentially uh, kind of circumvent this? Well, for each request, the, the, the client is going to have the JSON web token inside of the header. This is what we're expecting. Now, if the JSON web token is not in the header, then what we can do essentially is well, not authorize this request. And how do we do this? Well, we can do this with middleware. And middleware are essentially functions that are called in between one another. So over here, I can have a basically another function right here, another arrow function that is called before the final arrow function right over here, this one, this final arrow function that actually sends off our request. And similarly, this takes in a rec, a res, and something known as a next. And essentially, if everything is fine and dandy, if everything is fine and we want to move on to the next either middleware or final function, we basically call this next function. If it's not, then we can basically re return some sort of error. So inside of this middleware, what we can actually do is we can do something like, okay, well, let's say uh, user valid. So let's say we, we do some sort of check and and we figure out that the user is not valid. So this is not a valid user. Either they don't have the JSON web token or, or, it's, or it's been compromised in some way or it expired. What we can essentially do is we can basically say, well, if the user is valid, so if the user is valid, then what we can do is we can basically call this next function. Else, else what we can do uh, oops, what am I doing here? Else, what we can do is we can basically return res.json some sort of error. Now, the error is going to look exactly like what we have over here. So let's copy this error. So we can do something like this. So let's copy this. So we can do something like this, you know, um, you know, please log in, you know, or, 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 or something like access denied. So this is gonna be access denied. I completely forgot how to spell denied, so I'm just gonna say access D. So uh, let's do access denied. So over here, essentially, right now, let's say that we did some sort of check over here, and then, um, and then we realize that this is false. So basically, we get this access denied. So let's go over here, and let's just go and make this request again. And you can see here that we get access denied. Now, uh, let's say that this is true. We do our little check. We can go ahead and save this. And now, well, we get our tips. And that's exactly how we can authenticate certain routes. Now, we're not gonna particularly want to append this whole function after every single protected route that we are going to create. Instead, what we can do is we can get rid of that and essentially inside of here, we can basically create a folder for middleware. So in our root directory, we can create a middleware folder. And in this middleware folder, we can create any middleware that we want. Now the middleware that we are gonna wanna create is the check auth middleware. So the check auth middleware. And over here, we can simply do something like module.exports and then this is going to be, let's say, this is going to be async eventually because we are going to be using JSON web tokens. And so we can do rec res and then next. And then over here, essentially now what we can do is, well, we have exported this middleware right over here. So we can save this. And now for any protected route, what we can do now is we can say const check auth and we can basically require that in from the middleware uh, uh, directory. So middleware slash check auth. And if anything needs to be protected, we can just append check auth right over here. And because this logic is going to be exactly the same, it's better if we just store it right here. So if for some reason, we also want to uh, authenticate this. 
then we can add check auth right over here. But that's not where, what we're gonna wanna do in this case, so let's not worry about that. Okay, cool. So what really do we add in here? Now remember, for each request, the client is responsible for sending us JSON web tokens. Now in the request, it is typically found in the header, and so that is where we're going to have it. But if the client doesn't send us JSON web tokens, then we basically want to say, hey, you don't have access to this particular request, or if it sends us an invalid one, we also do the exact same thing. So over here, again, we're expecting the client to have some sort of JSON web token inside of the header. So we can say something like, okay, we want to get the token from the rec.header, and we, this can be really called whatever is want. So a header has a key and a value. So the key can be whatever, and then the value, of course, will be the, uh, the token. But typically, the key is called slash x slash auth slash token or something like bearer token. I like x slash auth slash token better. So you can say something like this. So we can say, okay, we want the token from this over here. Now, the first thing we can do is we can say, okay, is the token or is the JSON web token even present? So we can say, if it is not present, then we can go about throwing an error. So what is this error that we are going to throw? Well, again, we want to make our errors as consistent as possible. So we can basically paste this right over here. And we can say something like, no token found. So that is the first thing that we are going to do. And then the next thing is we want to actually validate that particular token. So now what we can basically say is um, JWT, and of course we're gonna get this from the JWT library. So we're gonna go over here and use the JWT to verify the token that we got back. So we can do something like JWT, and we're gonna require that from the JSON web token library. And again, we're gonna use JWT to verify this token. So now we can do something like J jwt.verify and here we provide it with the token and then we provide it with the secret that only our server is going to know. Now our secret is this thing right over here. Again, highly suggest that in a real application you store it somewhere a little more, a little more safer but this is where we're going to store it, just this plain text right in there. And then that is pretty much it. It just needs a token and it needs a secret. And basically what happens is, is if this uh, is valid, everything is fine and dandy, it can essentially move on to the next step. It gives us actually the payload of this uh, JSON web token. Remember the payload is this right over here. And remember we stored the email inside of our payload. So. This is what it's going to give us. It's going to give us the payload. And we actually can go about storing that payload inside of a variable. So it can be let user equal to JSON uh, JWT.verify the token and then the secret. Now this is going to be asynchronous, so we can await this. Now if, if this fails, what actually ends up happening is it actually triggers some sort of error. So what we can do now is we can basically put this in a try catch block. So if, if everything is fine, we get our user. However, if everything is not fine, it throws an error. So now, essentially, we would be in this catch block right over here, and we can say something like, we can say something like, um, token, token invalid. So token invalid. Now, if everything is fine, what we can do is in the request itself, what we can do is we can append a value known as user, and we can essentially say that this is going to be the user.email. So now for every single authenticated request, we actually have access to that particular user's email, which could be helpful for getting their information. And then, of course, we need to call the next function. So there we go, this is fine and dandy. So let's actually go about uh, doing this right now. So now if I were to make a request to this, you can see that no token is found. Let's go ahead and let's actually append just a random gibberish token. You can see that, hey, this is an invalid token. So now what we can do is let's say we go ahead and we log in over here. So let's log in, we created this token. So this token is now stored in the user's browser. And then we provided this token right over here. 
you can see here now we are completely authenticated and we have access to the data so that right there is the uh, authentication with JSON web tokens with express crash course I hope you guys learned a lot and I'll see you guys in the next one